Our scripture comes from the epistle of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. 1 Peter 2, 1 through 12. Therefore, putting aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisy and envy and all slander, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word that by it you may grow. Grow, there's a key verb, in respect to salvation. If you have tasted the kindness of the Lord, and coming to him as to a living stone, rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, you also, as living stones, are being built up in a spiritual house for a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For this is contained in Scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a choice stone, a precious cornerstone, and he who believes in him shall not be disappointed. This precious value then is for you who believe. But for those who disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the very cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. For they stumble because they are disobedient to the word and to this doom they were also appointed. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but you now you are the people of God. You have not received mercy, you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which will wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior excellent among the Gentiles so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, on account of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of visitation. Brothers and sisters in Christ, for me, nearing the 50th year of anniversary of my ordination, as I think back over the years, one of the great encouragements for me personally as a pastor and a preacher has been the abundance of means by which God in his word helps us understand the kingdom of God, our part in it, the glory of what Christ has done, the hope of the church, the state of God's people for eternity, and all the other aspects by which we describe the salvation that is richly given to us in Jesus Christ. This morning I suggested that examples are helpful. And I believe Noah's example of remarkable faithfulness is helpful in understanding it in the context of trial and challenge. But I believe parabolic figures of speech analogies, similes that God gives are helpful for the serious student of Scripture, the person who desires to grow in holiness, to move precisely in that direction. 
Think for a moment. Christ uses the picture of himself as a good shepherd, the good shepherd, and us as sheep. Christ reflects the best example of what it means that God is the great physician. That he is the lamb of God, slain before the foundation of the world. That he is the vine, and we are the branches. That he is the head of the analogy of the human body, the body being the church. And here we see this evening, he's related to us as a living stone. And then as if that were, and it is insufficient, that expands to the precious cornerstone. And related to that, we are called living stones, if indeed we're saved. This morning, when we considered faith that delights God, we were addressing one of the, I think I could say almost countless aspects of what it means to be in a relationship with God through Christ, and in particular, our union with Christ. When I read the words, Christ in us, or we in Christ, for me that provokes a whole series of thoughts on what that means in so many ways. To be united to Christ. We who were objects of condemnation. United. And I believe that this simile of Christ is the precious cornerstone, the ultimate living stone, and we as living stones can profit greatly from thinking through some of the implications for personal growth in grace. This is about sanctification. Now the idea of rock or stones as a figure for illustration is rich in scripture. Preparing this sermon, I became somewhat mind-boggled afresh at the many different ways God uses this figure of stones or of a rock to help us grasp what it means to be a productive, growing, maturing believer united to Christ. In Exodus 33, we have the example of a rock being connected to deliver us, to deliverance. As Moses, who had asked to see God's glory, was granted that, but God put him in a cleft of the rock, the rock of ages, if you will, cleft for him, to protect them as God passed, protect him as God passed by in his glory. Think for a minute. The first written expression of the law of God was accomplished by the finger of God writing in stone. What a tremendous picture of enduring truth of the word of God. In Deuteronomy chapter 32, Moses accuses the Jews in the wilderness of rejecting their God who is the rock of their salvation. Rejecting the rock that occurred early in redemptive history is a problem. Look at Psalm 18, please. Psalm 18, beginning with verse 30. I'll 
get the page turned here eventually. As for God, his way is blameless. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? Psalm 19. Verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. That's weighty. And as you recall in our meditation in that great passage from 1 Corinthians 10, Christ is described as the rock that followed the Israelites in the wilderness. So clearly this figure of speech carries weight with God. When the Israelites crossed into the promised land, you remember how Joshua instructed them to construct two memorials. Well, I shouldn't say instructed them because he instructed them in one because he himself did the other. He took 12 stones and put them in the middle of the Jordan River riverbed while the waters were held back. And then it goes on to point out that he told the Israelites, the head of each tribe, to take a stone out of the bed of the river and put them together as a memorial of God's deliverance. He picked rocks to do that. We know in Joshua, we have the record of a God-ordained method of execution of those who rejected his lordship and obedience to him, and that was stoning. You can read that in Joshua 7, the first account of stoning as a judiciary consequence of specific high-profile disobedience, stoning with rocks. As Isaiah 28, let's turn there for a moment. We have a promise. Isaiah 28, verse 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone for the foundation firmly placed, he who believes in it will not be disturbed. That's the passage, of course, that was quoted by Peter in the section we read in other places in the New Testament. It's one of the most quoted passages from the Old Testament. And then think for a moment of the Israelites in captivity. Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. The dream is about of a great image, the head of gold and upper body of silver and so on, down to feet of clay and iron mixed. And in that dream, a great stone is pried away from the mountain, comes down and crushes that idol into dust. And it's quite clear from what Daniel says that that rock that crushed the idol representing the kingdoms of antiquity is the church. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then think for a minute. 
when the Pharisees complained about the people praising him and his entry into Jerusalem, his rebuke was, if I tell them to be quiet, the children that were praising him, the stones will cry out. Consider for a moment Peter's confession, the great confession that the Roman Catholic Church abused for nearly two millennia. And Christ said, on this rock, this confessional rock, which confesses Christ, the heart of that confession, is Peter's words, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Upon that confession of Christ, which our Savior called a rock, the church will be built. We read the account in 1 Corinthians 10, where under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Paul clearly identifies Christ as the member of the Trinity, the second person of the Trinity, who led the Israelites out of Egypt and who followed them where that was necessary interposing himself between the Israelites and the armies of Pharaoh is a wonderful picture of his coming salvation and protection of his church. When John the Baptist began to preach, he warned the Jews not to trust in their hereditary descent from Abraham, as children of Abraham, because he said, God can from these stones raise up children. And then I'd like you to turn to Revelation 2 for a moment. Revelation chapter 2. And verse 17. Here are the words of Christ to the church at Pergamum, verse 17. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna. And that's a good text to be thinking about what we do with the Lord's Supper. And... I will give him a white stone and a new name written on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. So I'm going to propose to you a bold statement that if we neglect the theology and the glory of what's behind the theology of Christ as the rock of redemption, the rock of our salvation, as a, the ultimate living stone and ourselves as living stones, we will impoverish ourselves. We will be impoverished in appreciating our relationship with Christ and what it means to be part of his church. Would you turn, please, to Matthew 21? A brief but crucial declaration from the lips of our Savior. Matthew 21, verse 44. I'm going to read verse 20, 43 to set the stage for appreciating verse 44. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you, he's here referring to the Jews, and be given to a nation producing the fruit of it. And he who falls on this stone will be broken. To pieces. But on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust, like the great stone in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. And what is the 
text he was expositing, why this text concerning the rejected stone that's the precious cornerstone. You see that in verses 42 and 43. So what does it mean that if we fall on the stone, or he who falls on the stone will be broken, but he who is not broken that way will be scattered like dust. Now when you walk away from here, if you don't take anything else away with you, I encourage you to remember for the rest of your mortal days that every one of us, every one of you, has a relationship with the chief cornerstone that is either one of redemption or of judgment. Well, you may say, Pastor, where did you get that from the text? To come to Christ, we must have the brokenness of repentance and the awareness of our sin. If I do not understand the exceeding sinfulness of sin, I am fully persuaded it is impossible to adequately appreciate the incredible love and mercy that Christ extended to us in grace in going to the cross to bear the curse of Adam and the curse and guilt of our own sins. But if you are a person who is not willing to be broken spiritually, without which salvation is impossible, without repentance, there's no forgiveness of sin, without the brokenness of repentance, then what is in store for you is on the day of judgment to be crushed by the cornerstone. So every one of us, for either glory and good or for the horrors of judgment, to come has a relationship with the precious cornerstone that God has laid down. Now, at this point, I think I need to comment upon this idea of a cornerstone or living stones. I believe that one of the ways that God helps us appreciate his glory and his power and his supernatural and wondrous strength and mercy is to couch great truths in ways that we see something of what is a contradiction to the world, but not to the eyes of believers. Think for a minute. Stone represents one of the most durable commodities in the planet, does it not? We think about rocks, and they can be eroded slowly by the action of the waves on the seashore. But in the main, hard granite rock takes a great deal of climatological abuse to be worn down even visibly. It represents unchanging, solid, immutable reality. It's a picture of certainty. Rock is the antithesis of what's represented by sand. Consider the words of Christ at the end of his great introductory sermon to his public ministry. Matthew 7. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Your name cast out demons. Your name perform many miracles. And then I will declare to him, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Now that's a whole subject of warning against being entrapped in mechanical, as the 
Puritans would sometimes put it, put it, or liturgical worship without our hearts. But look how Christ then takes these two groups of people and relates them to this issue of preservation and permanence or catastrophic destruction. Verse 24, therefore everyone no exceptions. Everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who builds his house upon the rock. There it is. Even heeding the words of Christ constitutes a profound aspect of relating to this precious cornerstone, not just any old cornerstone, but the precious one. Now back to our text in 1 Peter 2. Verse 7, this precious value, and that's an interesting word, precious, meaning immeasurably valuable, this precious value then is for you who believe. So if tonight you consider yourself an adopted son or daughter of God, this is for you to appreciate, to consider, to ponder, to meditate upon, to pray about, to think about. What is your relationship to Christ in his capacity as a cornerstone. In 1 Corinthians 3, Paul points out that Christ is the only foundation upon which we can build if we are believers. So now let's narrow this to the part that includes us in this stonology. I could invent a term. This doctrine of cornerstone and spiritual stones. Obviously, Christ did not intend that we have hearts of stone. And in Ezekiel 11, we have a good call to understand that nowhere does the stones analogy or living stone apply to our heart. Ezekiel 11. Care to turn there? Ezekiel 11. Beginning with verse 19. And I shall give them one heart, and shall put a new spirit within them. And I shall take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes, keep my ordinances, and do this. Then they will be my people, and I shall be their gods. So we often speak of people having a stony heart, and that's not the kind of heart that we're to understand goes with being a living stone. And then there's another area that we need to be careful that we don't muddle this. You can find that in Mark chapter 13, if you care to turn there. Mark 13, the first two verses. And as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, behold what wonderful stones... And what wonderful buildings. And Christ said to him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone shall be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Now if you're interested in this, 
issue of the great temple in Jerusalem, and the original one, and this was the one, of course, built by Herod, that one of the more remarkable aspects of the original temple and those that followed was the cutting of the great stones for the temple that was accomplished at the rock quarry so that there was not the sound of chisel or hammer at the building site. And so these were not stones such as perhaps in a country wall in New England in the 1700s of rocks piled together. These were hewn stones in the temple. And Christ is clearly saying, don't think of the temple as that which is ultimate. It's going the way of all flesh. So the scripture is not talking about some kind of ultimate temple in the Jerusalem to signal the end or some such thing. Christ himself as the chief cornerstone came to enter into a relationship with his redeemed as living stones. So then I have to think a bit about what it means to be a cornerstone. Now we don't use cornerstones much anymore. We put up buildings with steel girders and so on. But for most of human history, any building of consequence, unless it was a mud hut or a grass cover of some kind or something carelessly thrown together, any building of consequence always had a cornerstone. And the placement of that cornerstone was considered crucial. And it affected all the rest of the building. So if we think of Christ as the chief cornerstone, in some careful way, We need to think of him as that to which we are measured, connected, related, and bound. The cornerstone of a building so properly constructed, in a very real sense, defines every subsequent stone cemented in place, in relationship to that cornerstone. So here comes this amazing, counterintuitive figure of speech that something as seemingly dead as a rock in the incredible, infinite love and power of God can become alive. The imagery is remarkable. I believe, for those with eyes to see it, it offers an insight into the amazing grace that God would condescend to come down to people who in their flesh are as hard-hearted as stones and change them into living stones. Amazing. That stretches the mind a bit to think about what does it mean to relate to Christ who himself, verse 4, is a living stone, and we say the ultimate one, rejected by men, but choice and precious in the sight of God, and we could add choice and precious in the sight of those whom he redeems. Now, I suggested this morning that one of the most distinguishing aspects of corporate worship is that we reject the ever-present idol of our way, our agenda, even if for a short season. And we can push that even further into thinking about the fact that in heaven there is a perpetual and total 
consuming glory and the agenda of God with ours gone as far as ourselves. Our only agenda is the will and purpose and person of God in heaven. And so, if you look at verse 8, I'm sorry, I've lost my place. I'll find it again, hopefully. But if you look at the text, that he who believes in him as the chief cornerstone will not be disappointed. Faith is the substance of what's hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But what about the stones of the temple? They're cut out of solid rock. The figure is powerful. And then they're chipped and sanded and smoothed. and reshaped until the chief builder is satisfied that they are fit to be laid in the foundation of which the chief cornerstone is the defining feature of that holy structure. If a living stone is a description of you, you are being prepared to be put into the structure of the eternal temple of God, which is Christ immutably, absolutely, incredibly united to his redeemed people. And are you willing to receive that sanding and that shaping and that smoothing. What a picture of the sanctifying work of God in the lives of those whom he has redeemed. I want you to go for a minute to first or to John 15. This is a crucial text relative to this idea of the living stones being fitted to be laid in the same building as the chief cornerstone in the same walls. John chapter 15. The great text on Christ is the vine and believers as the branches. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he... And then if you have a Bible that has marginal notes, there's a little one. And look over in the margin. It says cleanses. But now for... 200 plus years, an error has been perpetuated that translates that as prunes. Now, we live in an agricultural area, and I believe any farmer, and Dick, this might put you especially on the spot, in a good and blessed way, would be hard put to give an absolute distinction between cutting off a branch and pruning a branch. If I understand the word pruning, it means to cut off part or all of a branch. But that's not what's in the Greek. The Greek word and its English derivative is purge, which means to cleanse rigorously, energetically. And here is a picture of God the Father as the vine dresser, or it's translated husbandman, involving himself in every single fruitful vine, purging it. And it's not surprising that modern translators, centuries away from ancient viticulture, could make a blunder like this. Well, how can 
of the grapevine be purged. That doesn't make any sense. Oh, yes, it does. When you understand that in ancient Israel, and in indeed other places that had grapevines, the duty of the vine dresser was to go out in the morning with a bucket of soapy water and a little brush or a rag or a sponge and wash each leaf and wash each tendril and wash each cluster of growing grapes to protect them from aphids, and fungi, and other forms of pest. That's an incredible picture of the intense effort, concern, involvement of God the Father in salvation, that with those that are saved, we're not saved apart from holiness, that when we're redeemed and made part of the vine, he begins the washing process. Can you see the connection between that and the fitting of stones? Verse 5 of our text. You are being built up as a spiritual house. There's the figure you see of a building. But it's spiritual. For a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We could put it this way, God the Father is the heavenly stonemason, shaping us, scraping us, getting off the flaws, the corruptions that yet remain, in order that we may be united to the cornerstone. Now when you think about it, in a great temple, such as the one Solomon built, the intention was, and you read his prayer, that he thought it would be eternal. It was destroyed by the Babylonians after a number of generations of godless unbelief by the Israelites. But the idea is permanence. That we're fitted into that cornerstone defined structure. That spiritual house as a perpetual offering unto God, the ultimate dying unto self and living unto Christ. So if I really understand Christ is a precious cornerstone of what is being built, incorporating each and every true believer, then what Paul says in Colossians 1, I submit should be gripping. Let's turn there. Colossians 1. Colossians 1, I'm going to begin with verse 13. I love this verse. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to work for or to do his good pleasure. I hope this morning's texts have given you a renewed desire to do God's good pleasure and to be pleasing to him. And then... Verse 14, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent children of God above the reproach in the midst of the crooked and perverse generation amongst whom you appear lights in the world. Now, if I go to Colossians, I'll find the passage I want to read. Colossians 1, verse 13. For he delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, 
the forgiveness of sin. And he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. Paul is there referring to the same figure that he uses in 1 Corinthians. And he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that in himself, that he himself might come to have, get this carefully now, first place in everything. Pastor, really? Come on, preacher, you can't mean that seriously. Oh, yes, I can. First place in our affections, absolutely. First place in our purpose of existing and living, absolutely. But first place in our recreation, our hobbies, oh, yes. First place in our employment, absolutely. First place in our trials, absolutely. First place in our pleasure. First place in everything. And the picture of the cornerstone in a building is helpful in getting a grasp on that idea. So it's not just a nice theoretical intellectual exercise out there on the shelf of supposed godliness. This is real. Verse 19, for it was the Father's good pleasure, there's that idea of God's good pleasure again, for all the fullness, the fullness of everything to do with redemption, to dwell in Him. To put it another way, if we use our living stone analogy, that once we are transformed into a way that the world cannot understand, that's baffling for the world to think of us as living stones, that we understand that the immeasurable riches of joy and peace and glory and blessing and hope and pardon that flow through Christ to us it's well represented by him as the cornerstone and we are the building blocks of that holy house. Look at Paul's words in Ephesians 4. I trust most of you know the text well. In Ephesians chapter 4. I'm not used to this new Bible. My other one is disintegrated to the place. It's nearly unusable. And I'm not used to such thin pages, so I thank you for your forbearance. Ephesians 4, verse 15. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. And from the whole body, there's another one of these metaphors, the one Paul uses in Corinthians, being fitted and held together by that which every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body, the growth of the entity, the growth of the totality for the building up of itself in love. I think it's tremendous that in the Confession of Faith it says that under ordinary circumstances salvation apart from the church is just not possible. Verse 20 of Colossians 1. And through him to reconcile all things to himself having made peace through the blood of, the cro of his cross through him I say whether things on earth or things in heaven to reconcile all things to himself. 
well fellow living stones. What's your daily connection to the chief cornerstone? Is he precious? If you're a living stone, that's an inseparable part of being con connected to the greatest and ultimate living stone of all, Jesus Christ, the precious cornerstone. I'd like to close by reading again those two verses, 4 through 5 of 1 Peter chapter 2. And coming to him as a living stone rejected by men, the world rejects him. We know that. Part of the cost is being willing to be hated by the world. But coming to him as one who is precious in the sight of God. You also as living stones are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Pursue holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Father in heaven, we admit to you that it is easy to overlook or count as common and therefore unholy. The incredible blessing of being regarded by you and your Son, our Savior, as living stones, inseparably connected to Jesus Christ forever as the precious cornerstone. Will you give us hearts much inclined to praise you for that remarkable picture of your sanctification and engaging us as part of the body of Christ into a perfect unity that in heaven alone we shall see its perfect fulfillment. Fulfillment. Lord, we ask you now to give us a great sense of joy and of wonder that we, creatures of Adam, could be living stones cemented to Jesus Christ, the great cornerstone. We pray in his name. Amen.